for hymns. Never anger the person operating the PowerPoint, or you could be singing a hymn for three hours. They just keep scrolling the verses round. <laughs> Well, this morning we're looking at the story of Deborah, and it's in Judges chapter 4. And for those of you who are reading ahead and want to refresh your memories for tomorrow, uh, David and Bathsheba, which is in the second book of Samuel, chapter 11. Um, I don't know if you are like me, though. Uh, I've known the Bible all my life, but when I go to read something like that, I find I always need to read several chapters back and several chapters on, because it's pretty gripping stuff, isn't it? The Old Testament, it's pretty fascinating. I don't know how anyone can think the Bible is boring. Judges chapter 4, and again, you may want just to listen to the story rather than try and follow along. Uh, if you are following, please don't get concerned when I leave out some of the rather difficult to pronounce place names and things like that. In actual fact, I find that if you're trying to follow the flow of the story, it might just be a little easier if we don't put in all those complicated words. I do, I do know how to pronounce them, of course! Okay, now here's the starting line, and does this sound familiar? The Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to King Jabin, a Canaanite king. The commander of his army was Sisera, who had 900 iron chariots, and he ruthlessly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, for help. Now Deborah, the wife of Lapidoth, was a prophet who had become a judge in Israel. She would hold court under the palm of Deborah, and the Israelites came to her to settle their disputes. One day she sent for Barak, and she said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, commands you. Assemble ten thousand warriors at Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, commander of King Jabin's army, along with his chariots and warriors to the river Kishon. There I will give you victory over him. Barak told her, I will go, but only if you go with me. Very well, she replied, I will go with you, but since you have made this choice, you will receive no honor, for the Lord's victory over Sisera will be at the hands of a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, and at Kadesh, Barak called together 10,000 warriors who marched up with him, and Deborah also marched with them. Now, Heber, the Kenite, a descendant of Moses' brother-in-law, had moved away from the other members of his tribe, and he pitched his tent near Kadesh. When Sisera was told that Barak had gone up to Mount Tabor, he called for all 900 of his iron chariots and all of his warriors, and they marched to the river Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Get ready. Today the Lord will give you victory over Sisera, for the Lord is marching ahead of you. So Barak led his 10,000 warriors down the slopes of Mount Tabor into battle. When Barak attacked, the Lord threw Sisera and all of his charioteers and warriors into a panic. Then Sisera leapt down from his chariot and escaped on foot. Barak chased the enemy and their chariots, killing all of Sisera's warriors. Not a single one was left alive. Meanwhile, Sisera ran to the tent of Jael, who was the wife of Heber the Kenite, because Heber's family was on friendly terms with King Jabin. Jael went out to meet Sisera, and she said to him, Come into my tent, sir. Come in. Don't be afraid. So he went into her tent, and she covered him with a blanket. Please give me some water, he said. I'm thirsty. So she gave him some milk to drink and covered him again. Stand at the door of the tent, he told her. If anybody comes and asks you if there's anyone here, say no. But when Sisera fell asleep from exhaustion, Jael quietly crept up to him with a hammer and tent peg. 
Then she drove the tent peg through his temple and into the ground. And so he died. <laughs> when Barak came looking for Sisera, Jael went out to meet him. She said, come, and I will show you the man you are looking for. So he followed her into the tent and found Sisera lying there dead with the tent peg through his temple. So on that day, Israel saw God subdue Jabin, the Canaanite king. And from that time on, Israel became stronger and stronger against King Jabin until they finally destroyed him. Well, good morning. Well, I wonder what the lesson from this passage is this morning. Uh, avoid camping. Uh, <coughs> perhaps. <coughs> Certainly avoid women with mallets in their hand. <laughs> this, is a, this is an enormously uh, complex passage, uh, which we need to deal with seriously this morning here in the tent at Keswick. We've uh, dealt with Elijah and Samson, and now we come to a much less well-known character this morning, the character of Deborah, uh, one of the very few significant female leaders in the uh, Old Testament. Now, uh, she is married, and Jan and I are on our uh, wedding anniversary uh, uh, today, as, uh, as you've heard. Uh, my secret, by the way, for a happy marriage is... Uh, summed up in this uh, little, little poem, uh, uh, to keep your marriage brimming with love in the loving cup, when you're wrong, admit it, when you're right, shut up. Uh, <coughs> and I, I think that keeps marriages happy and together, uh, and, uh, and I commend it to you. Uh, it's certainly something uh, I found useful, not always managed to obey it, uh, I have to say. Now, something that we can say for certain this morning as we come to this passage, and in a minute, if you turn with me, I'm going to just uh, trace through the early chapters of uh, Judges, and then in this passage itself, the story. So in a moment, I'm going to take five or ten minutes simply to go through this passage and give you some, some little background pieces of information to fill in the things on leadership that I want to talk about this morning. It seems to me this passage has some things to say to us about the characteristics of leadership. That's going to be the broad theme today. Uh, but this one fact is certain. It can escape nobody's attention in this tent. And whatever your view on the subject of women or women in leadership, you can accept this as completely true. Deborah was a woman. Uh, that much we are absolutely certain about, okay. Uh, now, you might think, well, that's a little facetious, but actually it's quite important just to be clear uh, about that statement as we unpack what God seems to be saying today to the church through this fabulous revelation in his word. Now, I'm conscious that in talking about a woman leader, that the ice on which I skate is thin, and that there will be in this tent an enormous diversity of view about the role of women in marriage and the role of women in the church and the role of women in society. You have very different views. Put your hand up if you think yours is the right view. Yeah, okay, yes. <laughs> That's the problem, of course, <laughs> in this particular dilemma. And there are extremes even in this tent, just as there are extremes and polar polarities in the church. Uh, there are those at this extreme who believe that a woman's place uh, is in the wrong. Uh, and, uh, and that's a, a view at this end of the spectrum. On the other hand, at this end of the spectrum, there's Gloria Steinem's evocative phrase that a woman without a man is like a fish without a bicycle. Uh, and... Uh, uh, by the end of this message, you'll have got that, and it'll, be, uh, uh, it, it'll suddenly register. I actually like uh, uh, this quotation from uh, Rebecca West, who was one of the early feminists, uh, who said this, 
There is, of course, no reason for the existence of the male sex, except that one sometimes needs help in moving the piano. And I... Uh, <laughs> You'll have heard in the news, all the newspapers were full of it this last weekend, uh, that men are becoming increasingly irrelevant to the procreative process. And that actually, that, that statement has huge ethical implications, which of course we can't uh, touch this morning. But the role and relationship of the two genders inside the church and out of it is fraught with complexity and with difficulty. And I don't think a single person in this tent would argue that the role and relationship between men and women and the way it's perceived in society has changed enormously in the last 50 years. And so the preaching of the word doesn't come into a vacuum. The world is not the kind of world that existed when the Keswick Convention first began. It simply doesn't exist out there any more. Uh, that change in culture was brought home to me this week. I, I regularly read a, a news digest of the week. I've been doing it for a number of years now. And, uh, and this uh, week, it quoted tips on how to be a good wife from Good Housekeeping magazine, the 1955 edition. And reading it, I was staggered at the cultural changes. Just I read this, you'll sense, and particularly those of you who are under 40 and are uh, women married, your blood will boil at the, 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 the chauvinism implicit in these recommendations. They're perfectly serious. 1955 doesn't seem that long ago. Tip number one for a good wife, prepare yourself for his arrival home from work. <laughs> Touch up your makeup and put a ribbon in your hair. <laughs> ha have dinner ready. Most men are hungry when they come home. And the prospect of a good meal is part of the warm welcome he deserves. Three, make him comfortable. Have him lean back in an armchair and bring him a warm drink. Four, listen to him. You may have a dozen important things to tell him, but let him talk first. Listen, listen. His topics of conversation are more important than yours. <laughs> this, listen, 1955, good housekeeping, this is what it says. Don't complain, this is number five, don't complain if he's late home for dinner or even if he stays out all night. <laughs> listen, listen to this, count this as minor compared to what he might have gone through that day. <laughs> now, when I read that, I thought, that is not 1955, that is heaven. <laughs> so listen, we're going to get into judges now. Listen, we are going to get into judges. The world has changed. You, you're, you're, if I'd have read that in 1955 at the Keswick Convention, people would have just sat there. Can you believe it? They just sat there going, oh, yes, very good. Yeah, very good. <laughs> so don't you tell me the world hasn't changed. You've changed. I've changed. Our culture has changed. Yet into that changing world, the timeless, unchanging truths of the Bible are revealed. And that's the great miracle. And in fact, the femaleness of Deborah is not the prime point I want to make in this session this morning, although in a moment, that's going to have to be the starting point because it fairly clearly is a contentious and important issue. But the issues are related to leadership, not related to female leadership, fundamentally in this passage. Now, come with me before we get into that, and you can brace yourself if you'd like to, uh, to the beginning of Judges. Now, remember we said yesterday, looking at Samson, that the world of the Judges was an enormously turbulent, Wild West kind of environment in which Joshua, recently gone to be with God, had left behind him a land, Canaan, broadly subdued, though not entirely, 
but with the tribes not welded together into a nation state which was to be far more typical of the scene in David's time. So they're a ragtag and bobtail band struggling to find national identity, 12 tribes at odds with each other at times as well as at odds with the pagan nations around them. These 13 or so judges, we're not entirely sure how many there were, so I'm just going to mention in a word, some a longer section, about 13 judges ministering over a period of roughly 200 years at about 1,000 years before Christ. Into this turbulent world, a number of judges find themselves thrust. Now, Judges 1 and the first part of Judges 2, hope you've got your Bible open, you can follow this, are really a kind of summary of where the nations got to in the immediate aftermath of Joshua's death. And then in chapter 3, we read about Othniel, the first of the judges, Ehud, the second of the judges, and Shamgar may not have been a judge at all, <clears throat> simply a mighty warrior. So Deborah is either the third or the fourth judge. And each of these judges are introduced with a, a kind of literary device, a, a refrain, a chorus, if you will, that's repeated uh, in a way to set the scene for their work, which is largely about bringing the people of God back to the God of the people, bringing Yahweh's people back to Yahweh. And so that, that poetic device is found in chapter 3, verse 7 for the first time, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And that motif introduces the ministry of Othniel. And then in verse 12, five verses later, Ehud's ministry is introduced by the same Hebraic refrain. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And then if you come down to Deborah, and this is one of the reasons why most commentators don't think Shamgar was, a, was one of the judges because he's not introduced in this way and there's just one verse about him uh, as kind of afterthought. Deborah chapter 4, after Ehud died, sorry, Judges chapter 4, after Ehud died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord and Deborah is raised up. So you see the recurring theme and pattern through this piece of literature. The Israelites did evil, God raised up a judge to bring them back to God. The Israelites do evil, judge raises up and so on. And this pattern of backwards and forwards or round in a circle, however you want to see it, is the repeated refrain of the book of Judges. And so into that kind of maelstrom of evil, of desperation, of rebellion, God raises Deborah up. And indeed, it was a desperate time. In verse 3, you'll notice that these chariots, that is, uh, <clears throat> Sisera's army at the uh, say-so of King Jabin, had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried to the Lord for help. So this is no mere monthly oppression. This is no mere six months bit of a difficulty. This is a desperate period in Israelite history. The third judge is dealing with over 20 years of cruel oppression. It's really on the cusp of the change between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. It's a period when foot soldiers were increasingly giving way to the brutality of the Iron Chariot. Chariots could take out, as it were, dozens of men because they were enormous things, a uh, wooden frame, metal wheels, and it weren't completely iron, they'd have been far too heavy, but they had iron sort of wheels and iron accoutrements and iron weaponry sometimes sticking out the side. They were lethal things. So lethal were they that when they tipped up sometimes, they killed the very horses that were pulling them by both their weight and the knives and things that were sticking out from them. The Israelites did not have access to this. They only had access to numbers. They were largely a nomadic people, 40 years of wilderness wandering, and had not acquired the sophisticated weaponry of war of the settled peoples of which Jabin was king. Hazor was a very well-known city of the day, incredibly highly populated. So in Judges 4, you have the Israelites, 20 years of evil, really mountain warriors, uh, in the deserts, moving very quickly, but not able to cope with the incredible power of 900 
iron chariots. And into that mix comes Deborah, whose name means a bee. Uh, some of you remember the great Muhammad Ali aphorism that he floated like a butterfly and stung like a Deborah. Uh, <coughs> Deborah was capable both of uh, wise counsel, as we'll see in a moment, but she was also capable of decisive Action. And she was married to a man called Lapidoth, of which we know nothing, uh, apart from the fact that he was the husband of Deborah. In the early years of our marriage, when I acquired a certain notoriety, having written uh, quite a few books and began to preach on some major platforms, as they're sometimes called, uh, my wife longed for the day when I was introduced as, this is Janet Gorkrodger's husband. Uh, as opposed to her being introduced merely as this is Janet Gorkrodger's, this is Stephen Gorkrodger's wife, uh, which was sometimes done kindly, but sometimes done rather patronizingly. Uh, and so Lapidoth, whose name means torches, burning torches, only gets a mention here because he happens to be Deborah's husband. She's therefore a married woman. And she seems to have been leading or judging Israel at that time. And she held court under the palm of Deborah, which appears to be uh, an absolutely enormous tree uh, which presumably provided shade and people came to her for wisdom of various kinds. And then she sent for what presumably was the captain, verse 6, Barak, the captain of her host. Now, Barak seems to me to be a, a basically good man, uh, but who was a little slow on the uptake. Interestingly enough, Barak's name means lightning. Lightning by name, but not by nature. And so uh, she sends for Barak, who doesn't seem to have sensed the problem, although how you could avoid it, I don't know. And she says, go and take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulon, naming some of the tribes, and lead the way to Mount Tabor. This was not an unusual command, get into the mountain territory. And I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and troops to the Kishon River and give him into your hands. This is going to be significant military strategy, as we'll see in a moment. Barak says, initially what looks rather pathetically, but, it, but actually I think there's more to it than him simply being, you know, please, Deborah, come and hold my hand, which is hardly something a military captain would be able to say. Uh, I think it's actually more about him wanting a guarantee of God's presence in the battle. So I think we ought not to be overly harsh with Barak at this point. Very well, said Deborah, I will come with you, uh, but if I do, the honour will go to a woman. And it sounds like she means herself, but as the story unfolds, it transpires that it's going to be some other woman who's going to get the glory. So Deborah went with him, and the 10,000 men followed him, and they pitched their tent, and eventually Sisera gathered his 900 chariots and all the men with him, and they made what's quite a long journey, actually, from Harosheth Hagoim to the Kishon River. <coughs> may have taken them several days to get there. And then, when they got to the Kishon River, the prophetic word comes, we'll go back over all this in a moment, and Barak advances on the army, the army is routed, and Sisera abandons his chariot and, and flees on foot. Now, Judges 5 gives us the gloss, the commentary on how that happened, and it seems to imply that as the chariots came down towards the Kishon River, God arranged thunder and lightning and a flash flood, and the Kishon River overflowed its banks, and the heavy chariots got bogged down in the plain, the flood plain around the river, and so they were useless. Because the 10,000 light infantry were far more effective than 900 iron chariots sinking slowly into a muddy flood plain. Now, this is not an uncommon military strategy. The Americans struggled in Vietnam for years because they had got far greater firepower in every way, but the Viet Cong knew their way around the jungles of Southeast Asia. The Russians in Afghanistan were totally unable to put down the Mujahideen because they were light travelers. They were far greater in terms of tank power and plane power, but the Mujahideen hid in the mountains, and the Russians would chase them after these raids, and they'd just disappear into the desert. And this form of warfare is not uncommon. The light infantry defeat the heavy tanks on a muddy plain. Lure the tanks down to the mud plain, and what you'll find is victory for the light infantry. So they all fell, and they were killed, and they were in heavy armor, and, and, and maybe they were thrown from their tanks, and it was, just a, it was just a devastation. Sisera, however, verse 17, fled on foot, and he came to the tent of Jael, 
the wife of Heber the Kenite. Now, he probably thought he was safe because um, the Kenites and the, um, <coughs> uh, the Israelites, at least some of the tribes, were, had a pretty fractious relationship at various points. I told you on the first day uh, that I'm a Yorkshireman and uh, I grew up in Lancashire. It wasn't always safe. <laughs> the War of the Roses continued on in the school in which I found myself. There was a certain antipathy between those people from Lancashire and those people from Yorkshire. And there was a certain antipathy between some of the tribes and the Kenites. So Jael probably thought, uh, sorry, Sisera probably thought, I'll be pretty safe here. What he apparently didn't know was that at some point prior to this, the Kenites had made a kind of peace pact. A bit like Lancashire and Yorkshire putting out a joint cricket team. <laughs> and so, just as I would be very surprised by that eventuality, so Sisera would have been staggered that peace had been brokered between the Kenites and the Israelites. Anyway, peace does appear to have been brokered. And um, he goes into the tent and he asks for water. Very unusual, actually. I don't know where the men were. Perhaps they were out with the flocks. Most unusual in the ancient world to be anywhere near a woman alone. But he must have been desperate, very tired, very thirsty, possibly injured. May I have a drink? He asks if anyone's there. There isn't. And in the end, she doesn't give him uh, uh, water. She gives him what is called a skin of milk. Now, it may have been a kind of interesting drink that's more than milk. It's a kind of fermented uh, milk, which would taste slightly soured, uh, but had a, a kind of alcoholic dimension to it. Certainly, uh, probably not the kind of thing you'd put on your cornflakes. It seems a, a stronger kind of drink. So maybe he was both exhausted and slightly drugged. Either way, he must have been sleeping heavily because... For myself, I think I wouldn't notice if someone was trying to drive a tent peg through my temple. <laughs> However tired I was. And it's interesting, the writer of the judges doesn't commend this woman uh, at this point, although Deborah sings in very exultant terms in chapter 5. It's rather odd, actually. You, you, if John comes to the microphone at some point, uh, perhaps this evening, and leads us in a worship song with these words, you will be staggered. I can't think what the tune would be, but it, imagine it to something like, she'll be coming round the mountain when she comes. <laughs> her hand reached for the tent peg, her right hand for the workman's hammer, and she crushed his head and shattered it and pierced it. They're singing this, remember. And at his feet he sank, he fell, he lay. And then, in case you don't get the message, she says it again. At her feet he sank, he fell, he sank. Yeah, 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 we get the picture. And he fell dead, Ray. I mean, it's brutal stuff, isn't it? Absolutely brutal. And it's interesting that it's part of the brutal times in which the book of Judges is written. And so he does die. And Barak, in hot pursuit of Sisera, comes and Jael says, come on in, I'll show you the man you're looking for. And to Barak's complete amazement, the prophecy of Deborah comes true and the actual final nail in the coffin, if I can use that expression, the final tent peg in the temple is administered by Jael. And on that day, God subdued Jabin. He, he, was, he was totally broken by this conflict. And the hand of the Israelites grew stronger and stronger against Jabin, the Canaanite king, until they destroyed him. And so this wasn't the end of the battling, but it was the pivotal, fundamental battle. You know, in the Second and First World Wars, the history of military conflict, they describe the war unfolding. And as they do, almost all war historians describe battles in both 1917-18 and 1944-45, which they describe as the pivotal battle. After that, there was a mopping up operation. After that, there were several more months of war. After that, things went on and battle was still enjoined. But in that moment, the enemy was defeated. The Kaiser in the First World War, Hitler in the Second World War, and so on. And this is one of those moments in human history in which, although there was sporadic outfighting following on from this, nevertheless, at this point, the back of Canaanite power was clearly and powerfully 
broken. So it's a significant moment. And Judges 5 is the song giving praise to God for that significance. Okay, now I've taken a, quite a long time to spell out that background this morning uh, because it really is important that we do the Scripture justice and we try and understand what is actually being recorded here. Now, what are the messages for us as we try and apply that to our lives here at the Keswick Convention? Well, firstly, I want to say this about... I'm going to make a number of points now about leadership and its need, and its desperate need. Firstly, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth. She was leading the people. And remember that it's in desperate times. So the first point I want to make is desperate times demand courageous leaders. Time-serving, functionary bureaucrats might be all right for peacetime, but in wartime you need dynamic, you need God-filled, you need leaders of extraordinary passion, vision, and courage. And I am pleased to be able to tell you that in the line of these 13 judges, God saw fit to raise up a woman called Deborah to be the passionate, visionary, courageous leader these crisis times needed. Brothers and sisters, I hate to break this to you. I doubt if I am. I suspect you sense it every time you read your newspaper or see your news. We are living in desperate times. Do you believe that? We are in crisis times. All the statistics show the Church of Jesus in Great Britain in terminal decline. The people who read their Bibles every day or apparently are growing in discipleship, that statistic is in free fall, apparently. Once again... The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. We are in a desperate state in the church and we need to pray from a convention such as this that godly men and women will be raised up with courage to speak God's word powerfully, not the mealy-mouthed person who will just get by, but the man or the woman who will pay whatever price it takes to speak out for God, however they're criticized, outside the church and tragically, my brothers and sisters, inside it. They must speak. And listen, why do I think Deborah was a woman of courage? Well, because she was a woman. And this is where uh, it hits the rub, really, in this first point about leadership. Deborah was a woman. And there's no question, in the ancient world, the place of a woman in leadership was unusual. We've just got to admit that. Very, very few women rose to the kind of prominence which is accorded to Deborah. And so we recognize that she's unusual. What did her husband think about her going off, sitting under this tree every day, dispensing judgment to the nation of Israel? How did he feel about her calling Barak to herself and sending the people out to confront once and for all this horrific enemy? I don't know. But I know that if you are in a, an oppressed group, as women certainly were in the Middle East, and by the way, they still are today, if you're going to lead from that background, you better have the courage of your convictions. And I'll tell you this, the Church of Jesus in Britain has oppressed a whole series of groups in the last hundred years, and we ought to be ashamed of it. We have not seen working class people released into leadership in our middle class churches. Where are the black faces in our congregations? And where are the women whom God has called and gifted. I know that there are different views on women in leadership and, and we all claim biblical support for those views and I have no desire to tread on your toes this morning. Some of you will feel there is no ministry from which women are excluded in the church. Others of you will feel, and your basis on passages in Corinthians and Timothy and so on, you'll feel that women should be excluded from pastoral charge or from eldership or from teaching ministry and so on. And that's a perfectly, you know, biblical viewpoint. But brothers and sisters, we have to remember that there are godly, conservative, evangelical, Bible-believing Christians who have different views from us. And frankly, we are in no state to muck about on the edges of these issues. There's a world out there going to hell while we argue whether women can take the offering. We are sick. There's something wrong with us that our priorities are so distorted. How dare we, in the last century, send women all over the world into the worst possible situations and environment, telling them to go and conquer lands where no man has been or gone, preaching, planting churches, caring for people, and when we bring them back home, the best we can do for them is to get them to join the tea committee. It's obscene.
It cannot be justified by any biblical interpretation. And it's perfectly appropriate. As I've said, I want to repeat this. It may be that our view of Scripture demands that women be excluded from certain offices. So be it. We can agree among ourselves to disagree. But the reality is, still in general terms, we haven't given the liberty and the opportunity for women, for people of different colour or race or class or background. All one in Christ Jesus has been a mockery in many of our churches. And we've missed the opportunity to see significant gifts and ministry released. God help us to be fully released as the whole church. And God raised Deborah up. Praise God for her. It took courage to be a woman in leadership. It takes courage now to be a leader of any kind if you're going to be a good one. But I tell you this, God needs to raise up the Deborahs who rise above their background, rise above their gender restrictions, rise above their circumstances, rise above the cultural constraints that bound them and say, God, if you call me, I'm here. I'll go for you. I'll do it. Because the kingdom is the most important thing here. The desperate need to see the enemy conquered. 20 years Israel have been cruelly oppressed. How oppressed we have been in our modern Western culture. So Deborah, by definition, is a leader of incredible courage. May God raise up such leaders among us. Leaders who are not afraid to speak God's truth, not afraid to summon the barracks and together as a team take on the enemy. There's so much fear in Christian leadership. What will the people say? Folk, you pray for your pastor. You pray for your preachers in your church. Ask God to help them be more afraid of him than they are of you. Ask, ask for that. That prophetic insight into powerful, strong, courageous leadership. I love the story in the Living Bible. You know, Jan has been doing these Bible readings for us uh, uh, in the morning. She's going home this afternoon. She's leaving me on our wedding anniversary. I know you can't believe that. Can't believe that. But I've suffered worse blows in 20 years. It'll be, uh, it'll be okay. She's leaving me. She's... Uh, uh, she's going uh, home, so she won't be reading the Bible reading for the next two mornings. Uh, but I, yeah, I've really appreciated the fact that she's come and read the scripture to us powerfully and clearly, and she's reading from a new living translation. I, I've loved the Living Bible version. In Nehemiah 13, 25, in the Living Bible, you see a leader with real courage. The people of God in Nehemiah's time were marrying with other tribes and other religions. Nehemiah calls them together and he says this, this is a quote from the Living Bible. And I said to those people, as I gathered them together, the word of the Lord. And I punched some of them. <laughs> it, it says this, it says this, okay. It says this. And I pulled out their hair. This is in Nehemiah 13, 25, Living Bible, trust me. And then it says, after he'd punched them and pulled out their hair, it has this lovely little sentence. It says, and from then on, they did not marry. In, uh, in <laughs> Now that is leadership. I was never trained in that in my theological college. Oh, no. In my theological college, I was trained how to be nice to people. And when Mrs. So-and-so comes up and has a massive whinge, how you say to her, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, dear. <laughs> Friend of mine in a church in California, had a woman who was a friend of mine, an exaggeration, an acquaintance of mine. Actually, I don't know him very well at all, but, I, uh, <laughs> but he makes a better story. For 10 years, this woman, almost every Sunday, as she walked past him on the way out of church, shook his hand. And she said something negative about the service every Sunday. Didn't enjoy that. Thought the second point wasn't very good. Didn't enjoy the hymns. He's getting quite old, and he just, he just got... And every morning he'd say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, I'll think about that, and so on. And then one day, he said, something snapped inside me. And she said to me as she left, didn't like it this morning, he said, Madam, one day I'll bury you. My friend is leadership. 
I tell you this, no one's going to come to me for pastoral counselling this week, are you now, after all that, no. We need women and men of Deborah's courage to rise above the background that she found herself in, to be liberated from it, and to do what God calls us to do. Secondly, notice this in the conversation with Barak. Deborah does what she can do, but she doesn't do what she can't do. This is absolutely fundamental to all leadership. She leads, but she doesn't lead the troops into battle as the military commander. They wouldn't have followed her probably anyway as a woman. That would have been the final indignity. She is the spiritual, judging, visionary head of this cluster of tribes at this time. But she knows she can't do it all, and so she summons Barak, who wisely, in my view, knows that Deborah's presence is a kind of guarantee of God's presence in the military episode. And he wants to send the signal to the troops, not that they're being led by a woman particularly, but that by the presence of the representative of the living God is going with them. And so battle is assured. She's the one who called him in the first place. She's the one who senses God's in this. She's the one who drives him into this incredible victory. Come with me, Deborah. I think that was a shrewd move. And Deborah says, I will do so. Deborah did what she could, but she didn't do what she couldn't. Part of the problems with leadership in our churches is, A, we're not very courageous. We're mealy-mouthed, time-serving administrators who do our best at times simply to get through from one Sunday to another. Part of the problem in many of our churches, I can speak particularly for Baptist churches, but for many others, is that we've appointed the wrong people to lead our churches. We're training loads of pastors, but they're, and they're good and godly people, but they're not leaders. And the church desperately needs a way out of this morass in which we find ourselves. So we need courage, and we need those who recognize their limitations. There are many things I cannot do. Leaders who don't understand that end up either in burnout or in stupid mistakes because they do the whole thing themselves. And in their giftedness, people follow them. But where it's pretty obvious they're not gifted, people just think it's odd and a struggle. We've got to learn where we're not gifted, brothers and sisters. If you're in leadership, God's calling you this morning to do some things and to stop doing others. And you know, your church is just longing for you. If you're a leader this morning, your church is longing for you to stop doing some things. That will do two very special things in their church. One, it will bless them no end because you're boring them rigid <laughs> if you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. And secondly, other people will rise up who can do it as you mentor, train, and release those people. Now, of course, that's not easy. I just say that in a sentence. But it is true in terms of our church life. So she did what she could do, but not what she couldn't do. Time's running away from us this morning. Perhaps we'll just look uh, at another couple of things in this leadership profile. First, and then thirdly, notice that Deborah was not just courageous, not just clear about her gifts and clear about what she couldn't do in involving Barak in this great thing, but she, thirdly, heard from God. Let me tell you something. If I was asked to define the one characteristic of the leadership we need in this third millennium, it's this. We need men and women who hear from God. Because, you see, do you notice she's described not as a judge, but as a prophetess? It's quite interesting. Because the other judges, some of the others at least, are not described in anything like this way. They're described in more militaristic terms or they're described in more judicial terms as judges. But she is described as both a leader and judge and a prophetess. She sees God. I will go with you. Listen, verse 14. Go, Deborah says. Listen, this is a, she's at her prophetic best. This is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands has not the Lord gone ahead of you? Here she is being definingly spiritual. She's telling Barak that this battle's success is guaranteed. Because, why? Because she thinks it's a good idea? No. Because she knows there's going to be a flash flood in the plane, because she's already got it planned, she's got it somehow sneakily worked out? No, because she's heard from God. A.W. Tozer, on one occasion, made what I consider to be one of the most stark condemnations of perfunctory, ordinary Christian leadership. He said, the difference between the priest who has read and the prophet who has seen is as wide as the sea. 
We dare not have our pulpits filled with people who are merely clever theologically, brilliant administratively, attractive in the pulpit. We better have our leaders hearing from God. Part of the missing dimension of our churches is the prophetic insight that says we believe that God is in this and we walk with him. And when I talk about prophecy, my brothers and sisters, I am not speaking about those one sentence or two sentence contributions that sometimes come in the context of worship. They have their value. I'm not in any way being disparaging about them, but I'm not speaking of them in this context. I'm speaking about the prophetic in this Old Testament community, societal, ecclesiastical, the church setting. Women and men who stride the mountains with power, who hear God's voice. This journey was undertaken by Job in his suffering. Right at the end of the book of Job, after agony after agony, the loss of family, the loss of clothing, the loss of sheep, the loss of well-being, the loss of livelihood. What happens? Job gets right to the end of his book and he says this amazing sentence. I used to know you by the hearing of my ear, but now my eye sees you. David Coffey, helpfully last night, was reminding us that when we come to the cross, God exchanges an ear for an eye. We don't just hear the truth. We see Jesus in all his glory and suddenly we're transformed. Our churches will not be transformed by leadership that is simply keeping abreast of all the latest programs that are coming out of the United States or the latest book or the latest bestseller or the latest video series or the latest courses. These things have their place, but they are no substitute from leaders who hear from God. And we desperately need to cry out for this Deborah authority in our lives. The willingness to go out on a limb for God, to hear his voice clearly and to respond to it. And we need leaders who are into the scripture and into prayer and into openness to the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives and into submission to his will and into seeing him as what matters more than anything else. Poor old Deborah could easily have been crushed by the cabal of men that must have been around at the time. Yet courage marks her leadership. She could easily have been arrogant once she'd established her position and done everything, but she recognizes the wisdom of letting Barak do his thing so that she can do her thing, and together they're far stronger than they are separate. And thirdly, she is a woman in touch with God, the source of power. Great to be in touch with the source of power. The final authority. It's really, it's really great. You know, there's certain, certain things about being a speaker that are really, really good. Get a nice badge. I, I've lost mine, actually, but I, I know that members of the Keswick Committee are here in the tent and I'm promising to go back and try and find it. But it's great because it, it can get you in places. And, uh, and it's really helpful because before people recognize your face, they recognize the authority of the Keswick badge. And then when they do recognize your face, in my case, they throw you out. But the, the, uh, the, it, it gives access. Is the badge powerful? No, it's just a piece of plastic. But the authority behind it gains you access. Folks, prayer, reading the Bible, listening to God, worship, and so on. These things don't seem very much in themselves, but they are access points into the power behind them. This ancient book, for all uh, that it was written 2,000 years ago and more, is the access point into the power of the living God. No wonder its stories are important. No wonder we should hear tales of Elijah and Samson and Deborah and David and Joshua to thrill our souls. Ordinary people like us who did extraordinary exploits for God because they heard from him and despite the cost, went for it, served him, loved him, followed him. Let's pray for an army of such leaders to be raised up in our churches and to affect our nation for the good news of Jesus that our churches will be transformed by the kind of leaders we pray into place over these next few years. The Lord bless you.